as Rick mentioned, please write your questions in the chat and uh, sorry, in the Q&A, not in the chat. And I will be, first of all, going through a presentation outlining some of the key things around achieving the, uh, healthcare excellence with testing. And then I'll be going into a live application afterwards. So first of all, let's get going. So today's agenda, first of all, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the challenges around doing development and testing in the healthcare industry. So whether you are a manufacturer making medical devices, you're a software developer building software that's going to be used in the, the life science industry, or you're a, a provider system hospital that has to deploy IT, uh, these challenges uh, will hopefully resonate with you. We'll then talk about some of the best practices around software requirements and testing uh, in the life science industry. I'll then um, give you an overview of the Inflectra platform and particularly the Spira team and Spira plan uh, products. And then I'll be doing a deep dive into the Spira team and Spira plan compliance features. And I will give a, a disclosure here. Uh, in the agenda at the beginning, we talked about Spira team. Uh, most of the features I'll be talking about are in the Spira team product. There is one feature, risk management, that is actually only in our Spira plan edition. I uh, will be clear to distinguish uh, what's in each version. And then as Rick mentioned, we'll go into Q&A. Uh, oh, sorry, live app, live demo, and then Q&A. So some of, what are the challenges around development and testing in the healthcare industry? So one of the things, obviously, is that whether you are developing medical devices, and that could be a device that could be implanted in the body, like a pacemaker. It could be you're doing uh, clinical trials of medical devices, if you're not the manufacturer, but you're doing independent trials of, of such devices or IT systems that are going to be used in a clinical environment. Or you could be building a hospital information system, uh, managing uh, patient records, e-health records, for example. Or you could be building a system to coordinate care. Um, compliance is critical. Uh, and as we know, the life Life science industry is heavily regulated, and these regulations are changing. In fact, as we speak, there is a move to move from the um, clinical system validation, or CSV, to what's called clinical system assurance, or, or CSA, which is a different approach in how we do testing and validation of clinical systems. Uh, and with this move to this assurance model, a CSA model, we're moving from a point in time model where we build something and test it, and that's it, to where we do continuous testing. Um, as we talk about IT systems moving towards a continuous deployment model, writing software, releasing it in updates, uh, hardware systems are being impacted by that as well. You may have an embedded device that does receive updates and you have to pr produce new versions of that device. Um, so how do you do continuous testing? How do you have real-time traceability and validation when things are no longer static? And as we saw in the pandemic, uh, you have to be adaptable to real-time needs. But even though there may be um, waivers given when you, you know, come up with an innovative solution that's being rushed to market, uh, when the, the dust settles, you still have to maintain compliance. For example, we have quite a few customers that work with us that are startups in the biotech space, and they are developing you know, applications in a very agile fashion, similar to any other software company uh, you'd see in Silicon Valley. The difference is that if they're successful, they're going to have to go through things like FDA uh, trials and testing and validation. Uh, so even though they may be a small startup today, they have to plan on scaling, plan on being compliant right from day one. Otherwise, the work to become compliant later could be overwhelming. So that's one of the, some of the key challenges. And if you want to go a little bit deeper into that, one of the, the challenges you'll find is that you have to validate your systems. Uh, it's part of the CFR Part 11 compliance in the US and the equivalent regulations in Europe. And that means you have to test the systems. So not just test what you're building, whether it's a drug, a device, or a, an, an IT system. Obviously, you have to test and validate that, but you also have to test and validate the systems you're using to develop it, test it, manage it. All the systems that touch it have to also be tested and validated. And that includes, for example, a test management tool like Spira, a requirements management tool, but also software development tools, IT infrastructure. All of that needs to be validated and tested, not just what you're building yourself. <clears throat> the other thing we're seeing is, of course, things are happening faster. So we need to move faster and we need to be able to deliver functionality quicker. Uh, but on the other hand, as I mentioned earlier on, the rules are just delayed, they're not removed. So we need to be agile now, being able to release functionality faster into the hands of uh, potential patients, into trials, but we have to maintain compliance. We can't be cavalier about it. And so we'll talk about how you can achieve the best of both worlds, agile yet compliant. And then this is the goal, you know, be agile, but 
today, building new functionality, being innovative, doing R&D in an efficient and timely way, but then also having the necessary paperwork, the necessary evidence in place so that when we have to go for a validation and uh, audits and so on, we are ready and compliant. And we actually follow this practice ourselves at Inflectra. Our Spira platform is developed using an agile methodology. We use sprints and we have continuous integration, continuous deployment, and yet we are able to have, be fully compliant. We meet with auditors and we're able to show them evidence of everything we do uh, all the time. So if we can do it, you can too. So what are some of the best practices in software validation and testing? Well, the first thing is, if possible, avoid manual methods and manual is not just literally paper there are some places where it's physically printed out paper you know stacks in a filing cabinet hopefully that's not you but when we say manual methods a lot of times what we're seeing is a lot of customers uh, are using artifacts in excel spreadsheets or word documents so they have a giant set of requirements documents in microsoft word and they have spreadsheets with test plans and test scenarios and so on um, they do often have some tools they may have some tools for project management maybe some backlog planning tools but those tools are not the official validated tools so for example they might use jira or azure devops to do some of the, the, the planning and, and some of the backlog management uh, with, with user stories but then what they have is they have all these other documents that are being managed outside the system and now they have these two different worlds they're in competition and so a lot of the requirements and things they're testing against are really coming in the are in these document forms they're not in the tools being used and the tools are not really the official record of anything this means that you can admit miss patterns and deficiencies i mean how can you find a test that's affecting every single requirement when you've got everything in different documents i mean that's a massive bureaucratic uh, exercise so having a real-time tool that's showing you all your information in one sheet of music is really important so you don't miss things the other best practice would be creating integrated process across your disciplines, making sure that your requirements team is integrated fully with the testing and QA team, people doing the test management, the quality management, uh, also people on the product development side and the change management side, make sure those are connected back to your requirements as well. Um, if you are using our, our Spira plan product, we also can talk about risk management, and we are seeing in the medical device sector a move towards not just risk-based risk -based testing, which of course is all in vogue right now, but also risk-based development. Risk-based development is where you actually take risks, patient risks, and that's your first uh, level. And from your patient risks, you derive your, your safety requirements. And then from your safety requirements, you, you derive your test cases. So traditionally, you would start with requirements and develop your tests. With risk-based development, you actually start with risks and then developing requirements and then developing tests. And that's becoming a, a best practice increasingly. And another thing that's really important is where are you going to store the documentation? Uh, do you have a plan for controlling and managing all the documentation you're generating? And what's the source of truth for that? Is the source of truth going to be your artifacts, like your requirements, your test cases? Is it going to be the documents that are generated from the system? Uh, what is the value of the source of truth? Uh, and there's no right or wrong way. Uh, some customers of ours, um, they realize that they want to maintain a validated system. So uh, and they, therefore, the artifacts inspire the requirements, the tests, the tasks, the code, everything that's in the system is a source of truth and the documents they generate are just for uh, reporting purposes there are other clients that are not as far along this journey and they use Spyro to manage everything but the source of truth from a validation standpoint is actually the generated report which they then archive in the system and sign off on and so you could do it both ways or, or maybe it's a transition you start with the latter approach and then move to the former approach as you improve maturity um, now in the ideal world the source of truth should be the system. Uh, it should not be the documentation. Uh, but obviously, as I mentioned, that can sometimes be difficult for companies that are coming from a very traditional paper-based system. So you should aim as a best practice, though, to move towards the idea where the source of truth is the system. So a requirement defined in Spira is a source of truth, not a document that contains 100 requirements generated from Spira. That's a report. That's not the source of the truth. Um, the danger, of course, is if you are not uh, if you don't mandate that, people start to work around the system. They will start to do things in Excel or Word because it's easier. They can they can bypass the workflows and they can then at the end glue it all together and have someone sign off on it. So be really careful. Make sure that you ha your system is both validated and appropriate, but also don't make it unusable. Don't make the workflow so complicated in the tools that people start to work around it because it's not, not feasible to actually work in the tool. And that's always one of the balances when we get into the details about configuring the system is you want to make it usable on the one hand but also compliant on the other and those two things are often at odds with each other
Uh, we do find there's a big cultural change. People who've come from the traditional world of, of uh, validation and, and clinical systems, they often think of things in terms of documents, a requirements document, a test document, a test plan, and so on. Um, and when you're looking at using a system like Spira, you're moving away from a document into data, which is being used to drive results. And that's a big change, though. So you need to plan for the cultural change that that will be. The other thing is make sure you configure the system to match your process. Uh, we'll talk as we get later on in some of the features that we offer around workflows, approvals and e-signatures, but the key is it should match your process and get, make sure your process is actually what you follow. Some of us will talk to customers and their process that they're actually documenting is not the one they even want, it's just what they're using today. And then instead of coming up with a new, more agile process, they end up trying to force fit their current process into the system and then reconfigure it later. So make sure that whatever process you want to implement in a system System is the desired one because you're going to go through the hassle of moving people from a paper-based system to an on on electronic online system um, there's already one step change management you want to make sure they're moving to the, the ideal best practices that you have developed don't just simply take what you have today and throw it into a system so that's some of the best practices we've seen for customers who've been successful with this. Um, now let's talk about the Inflectra platform overall. And the Inflectra platform, really the goal and the value proposition we offer is we can bridge these two worlds between the left-hand side and the right-hand side. So on the right-hand side, particularly those working uh, with, with software, software, hardware, hybrid systems, um, you know, we want to deliver things more quickly. We want to be more agile, more innovative, get to move to market faster, beat our competitors. And for that, we need things like uh, continuous integration, continuous deployment. We're using agile, scaled agile, Scrum, Kanban, depending on the scale of the problem. Uh, we're using tools like DevOps, and we have people working in different locations. We have remote working, and we, we may be using cloud-based systems uh, because it's easy, uh, it's efficient. It lets people have remote access from anywhere in the world. Um, and that's the way the industry is moving to the right. At the same time as that, though, however, we do have to support the things on the left. Um, we can't just simply say we're going to throw out functionality, throw out a system uh, that hasn't been tested. We have to prove that we have compliance with all the requirements we've defined. We have to make sure the platform itself is validated. We have to make sure that we have the right workflows, make sure the data privacy of any patient data is maintained if it's HIPAA compliant. We have to have electronic signatures for part 11. All those different things that we talk about on the left have to be maintained. And so there is this tension between being agile and fast and also being compliant. But Spira plan from Inflectra is the tool that helps you uh, bridge that gap. And in doing so, we do support many different uh, standards. Uh, the focus of this webinar is on the healthcare industry. So the FDA is 21 part 11 and the FDA guidance on data integrity. We also do support with the equivalent European regulations as listed there. Uh, but Spire is a general platform. It is not healthcare specific. And so we do have functionality in there for dealing with other highly regulated industries as well, like automotive, which is the ISO 26262. We have standards for risk management for manufacturing systems as well. Uh, we also have support for aerospace standard DO178C. So Spire is designed to work in different industries with different standards. And there are different workflows and templates of available to speed your uh, deployment of the tool for that specific for your specific industry. Now I have talked about some different tools. Um, we've talked about Spire Team and Plan principally. Uh, the Inflector Suite is actually made up of several different tools that work together as an integrated suite. In the core, we have the Spira uh, platform, which is made up of three different flavors. So you either have Spira Test Team or Plan. Uh, in this presentation, we're focusing on Spira Team, which will be a lifecycle management solution for team sizes, for projects, and Spira Plan is the enterprise version of that. So you would either look at Spira Team or Spira Plan. Uh, we do have some other cut down versions like Spira Test, which will be used for for a QA team um, that misses a lot of the lifecycle management and traceability features, doesn't have the code management, uh, doesn't have the risk management. So we won't be talking about that today. Uh, and of course, we do have other features that add on to Spira. We have our Tara Vault code management solution based on Git subversion. We also have a service desk. So if you have to have traceability from customer requests and be able to track those customer requests into your lifecycle, uh, you could look at using Chronodesk to do the end user support management and service desk management. We have Spira Capture for exploratory testing, which is really great if you're doing any kind of uh, application level testing and the functionality is still fluid. And then when you're doing large scale validation and regression testing, uh, we have the Rapease automation tool. And Rapease is very important as part of this picture, because if you are moving towards a continuous uh, you know, assurance model where you're you know, releasing new versions quickly, 
there's not going to be enough time to test everything and validate everything manually. So once you've defined your requirements and tests in Spira and they're all being signed off on, uh, automating them using a tool like Rupees makes a lot of sense because it will mean you can do validation much faster and more efficiently, especially in this continuous model that we're moving towards. And as I mentioned, Spira Plan is the enterprise version of our suite. So uh, in this demonstration, we'll be talking about Spira Team and Plan. If you're a smaller company, Spira Team is probably sufficient for your needs. If you're a larger organization, I would actually look, look at Spira Plan instead. So let's look at some of the features that we have uh, that really help you on the on this journey of, of compliance and automation. First of all, um, Spira has end-to-end -end traceability out of the box. We'll see it live in the application. We can link requirements to test cases, to tasks, to risks, to code, to code snippets, to, uh, to test runs, to defects, to issues. Uh, all of that traceability is end-to-end -end and out of the box. You don't have to install other plugins and other um, add-ons to make that happen. It's built in on day one. Uh, data privacy is really important to us, and we, we know it's important to you. So data privacy and security are built in as well. We offer uh, both a regional cloud-hosted model, where you we host the data in our cloud platform, and the data can be locked to your region. So if you're uh, following HIPAA and the data must be in the US, we will lock into the US region. If you're in Canada doing healthcare testing and data, the data has to stay in Canada. Uh, we can do the same thing there. It will stay only in our Canadian regions. Similarly for the European Union, Australia, Singapore, India, we have different regions set up and they're all isolated from each other. So if you store data in any of our individual regions, the data is replicated within that region for a disaster recovery, but it never leaves that region. And we have some of the highest industry standards, security, security industry standards in place, including SOC 2. Uh, so we are there to, you know, as a guaranteed partner of yours. And for those customers that need an extra level of security, you can deploy Spire completely on-premise on an air gap network as well. Uh, another very important feature in Spira is the reporting and document generation features. It's all very good having the data in the system that's been validated, but you will have to generate reports to give to auditors or third parties. Um, I mean, you can do that directly from Spira with its built-in and customizable report generation feature. When we get into the um, compliance with 21 part 11, a really important part of Spira is the fact it's got in support for customizable workflows and most importantly, electronic signatures where you can sign off a change and it gets hashed with a cryptographic hash as part of the signature. And the other thing we're now going to offer is the ability to integrate multiple instances of Spira together across the value chain. This last one on the bottom right is a new feature we're adding this year called Spira.net. And that, would, that means if you're working with different suppliers, uh, you can mandate your supplier uses Spira in their organization. And we can now synchronize different instances instances of Spira together. So if you're, for example, a end user manufacturer and you've got other companies that are making comp components or reagents that you're using as part of your, your end user solution, uh, you can actually have them use Spira, you use Spira, and all for your, if all your suppliers do in fact use Spira together separately, you can now integrate the, all the instances together and synchronize the information between them. Still allowing the data to remain completely separated on your instance, but only synchronizing the pieces that you want. When it comes to life science specifically, uh, we do, as I mentioned, have the 21 part 11 compliance with electronic signatures. We will sign uh, BAA agreement, agreements for HIPAA compliance, and we do have an end-to-end -end traceability for requirements, tests, and code. One other really important feature uh, for life science customers is the fact that, our, fact that our platform itself has been independently validated by a third party, and we can control, we can let you control the update cadence. So what that means is many times when you're looking at a cloud-based solution for managing requirements, requirements and test cases. Uh, the problem is that cloud platforms will update you know, once a month, once every couple of weeks. And if you're validating that platform for your needs, um, the need to revalidate every week or every month will become an undue burden. So we actually let you control that cadence. We can give you a dev instance that you can have updating automatically on our standard schedule, and you can have your own version that remains locked to a version, and then you can tell us when you want to update, and that way it reduces the validation burden on your organization. Um, some of the features that we have in Spira that, sh that are designed for compliance and, and uh, testing would be requirements management in multiple different views. As you can see here, we've got requirements management functionality. We've got a grid that shows requirements linked to test cases and tasks. We've got a nice a mind map view where you can see all the traceability in a graphical form. And then we have a document view, which is more like a traditional Word document, uh, where you can actually see all the requirements written out in full, and you can edit them live in line. And these different views are actually all the same information. They 
they're just different representations. And we also have an agile board view, which I'll show you in the live application. And that's again, the same information. So if you have a software team working in agile boards, you've got a hardware team working in documents, they can all work from the same sheet of music, literally, and be full, fully sharing all the information in real time. Um, we do have the integrated test validation. So each of those requirements that you see here is linked to a, a series of test cases. They can be manual tests that you're doing. Uh, if it's a software device, they can be tested using the Spira. If they're a physical device, you can use it on a mobile device with a camera, take pictures in a lab. If it's a, a um, software solution, you could use Rupees for automated testing to do the, the testing of the app. If it's a hardware solution, we've got clients that have plugged in their own um, hardware test harnesses into Spira using our API to report back uh, information information into the system as well. And we do integrate with some other automation tools that are more that are geared towards different types of um, hardware or software testing. Uh, for example, Eggplant is very strong in, in visual testing of graphical interfaces, and we, we're, we're a partner of theirs and we integrate very closely with them as well. Uh, when we talk about traceability, this is an example where you can see one requirement, this feature, it's linked to three test cases that are passed, and we can track and add and trace the coverage between that requirement and that test case. And furthermore, the association we would create or between this requirement and those three test cases is versioned. So if someone was to add a link from a requirement to a test case, or more importantly, remove it, that will be tracked in the history of an audit log in Spira. So if someone you know changes not just the core system, they change a requirement, change the field, change the description, but not just that, but also if they change the associations, those are all going to be tracked in the version history in Spira as well. And I'll show you that in the live app. Uh, another thing, important thing is the end to end traceability. So you can see from this one, one requirement, not just the link to the test cases, but also all of the direct and derived traces from this one requirement. So you can see we have the ability to add new books to the system. That's our requirement. You can see it's got four associations. The, the first one, the third one and fourth one are marked as related to. So we've got this one requirement that's linked to the other requirement, which is the first one, and the different requirement, which is the last one. And you can create these associations. They can be directional or they can be just simple, uh, simple relationships. But the second one is a bit different. It's an implicit relationship. That's an example of a derived uh, traceability link. Because, for example, you have a requirement linked to a test. The test failed the defect was logged because the test failed. This defect that was logged from testing is automatically linked back to the source requirement through that test run. And that way you don't have to go and manually find that test result and that defect and add it. Whenever the test fails and the defect is logged, we're automatically adding it as a trace link, a derived trace link back to the requirement. Same thing with code commits and builds. If you're using CI tools like Jenkins, when there's run, we will link automatically the commits and the associated build events back to the source requirement where they came from. If you're using the Spira plan version of our product, it does come with integrated risk management. So you can see uh, all of the risks in the product and you can then manage those risks by probability and by impact. From that, we will calculate the exposure of that risk and you can use that risk to then derive your requirements, your tests, and you can map the requirements uh, to the risks. And we can even do risk-based testing where we'll take those uh, mapped requirements to risks and requirements to test cases. And we can tell you which of the test cases will overall reduce the, the maximum amount of risk exposure in the system, allowing you to basically prioritize testing based on risk exposure. You can also run reports to find out which of your requirements are covered by which risks, and same thing with the test cases as well. For those working in a hardware space or a manufacturing space, we do also support FMEA level risk management, where we can add the third factor for detectability, so you now have probability, impact, and detectability, giving you a risk priority number, so we can do that as well. Um, content is really important, and Spyro does have a document management system built in. Uh, so if you are doing things like diagrams or any metrics, anything that you need to capture, Spyro has built in ability to manage the documents. It can manage rich text content. It can manage. It can help you draw and manage diagrams and spreadsheets, and, and all that content can be natively created in Spyro. It does come with a workflow and the ability, as you can see here, to approve the document, reject the document and maintain the different versions and when it's signed off on we can lock the final version so it can't be edited and we do support electronic signatures of the documents as well 
Another really cool feature is that when you run, say, a report, like a requirements traceability report or a final requirements report, especially for the clients that have not yet made the move to validating the artifacts but still want to validate the documents generated, you can take the generated report and it will automatically generate a PDF version of that final report and put it into the Spyro document management repository and it will email everyone out for a review and then you can use the review and approval part of the system to review the documents inside of Spyro as well. Um, a key feature I've mentioned a few times already, but let's show you a screen of it, uh, workflow and electronic signatures. So in Spyro, there is support for uh, electronic signatures. We support them at the requirement level, the release level, the test case level, the task level, the defect level, and the document level. And so you can move a particular artifact from one state to the other, and then you enter the electronic signature, uh, and that tracks the meaning of the signature and stores that with the change record, and it hashes it using a cryptographic hash so it can't be tampered with giving you assurance that the signature is valid. Uh, Spyro does come with uh, source code management functionality. This is particularly useful for those working in uh, either building IT systems for hospitals or medical medical establishments, or those working on embedded systems uh, where there is a software and a hardware component. One of the key things you have to demonstrate to an auditor will be, uh, do all the code commits have a valid reason for being for being committed? You know, why did we change these six lines of code? Uh, what was the reason? Did someone inject a, you know, unfortunately malware into the system? Hopefully not. Uh, was someone was that an authorized change? So every time you make any change to code, it will be tracked back to a Spyro artifact, and we can then link that, and then you'll be able to go to every single commit and see all the artifacts that commit derives it was linked to, and it's a bidirectional view. You can look at a requirement, see all the code commits that relate to it. You can go to a code commit like this one, and you can see all the files that were changed. You can see all of the artifacts that were the reason for the change, and we even have um, software Difference highlighting as well, which I'll show you where you can see the, the coding, the color coding of the changes in the code. Uh, Spyro does, of course, track uh, all kinds of other artifacts, other kinds of activity. Uh, typically, uh, if you're running tests and they fail, you'd be logging defects and bugs, but it can be used beyond that. Our issue tracking system can be used to track actual business issues. It can be used to track change requests. Um, so it can be used to track anything that's basically requiring a change in the system that's not planned as a requirement. Um, and we have different workflows available so that a bug or a defect can follow a different workflow than, say, a change request or an enhancement or a policy change, whatever is whatever it is you're tracking, or a documentation change or a training change. They can all be tracked as different types in the system with different workflows. Uh, some might require e-signatures, some might not. That's really up to you, and you have that level of customizability available. I mentioned this already, but let's let's have a look at the screen of it. Audit trail. So whenever you change anything in Spira, uh, we do maintain a, a record of the change. So who made the change, when the change was made. If it was a part of an electronic signature, there'll be a, a signature record as well that will, be, that will show up. And also if it's a uh, a association change that will also show up as well and we also have a new advanced feature called baselining which takes the audit trail that we already have and takes it one step further baselining lets you create snapshots of the system at different key points and track the changes between those key points uh, another really important feature for those working in regulated life science industries uh, is the fact that we can control access to the system. Spyro does come with a very granular permission model, so you can create different roles and different permissions and lock down the system to this, just those who need to be able to make that particular change. So it gives you a very high degree of control over all the different artifacts and the permissions those artifacts can do. Another really important feature these days is, is being able to control authentication and access to the system. If you're using our on-premise, uh, version of Spira, typically you'll be using our LDAP or Active Directory integration. If you're working on the cloud, you'll typically want to use our OAuth um, single sign-on option. And single OAuth single sign-on works with things like ADFS, uh, it works with GitHub, GitLab, or Google. It also works with Okta, and uh, probably the most popular is Azure AD. So if you are using the Microsoft Azure AD uh, system, you can now authenticate your access to Spira with any of those providers. We also do support one login and any other OAuth compatible provider as well. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, we are fully agile. We do have different boards built into Spira. This is an example of some of the boards that we have. We're also in the process of actually revamping all the boards. So I can show you a preview of that as well. Um, and that way you can track by release and by sprint all the activities going on 
and who's working on which version, in which sprint, uh, what's the status. And each of those boards will show you not just the story cards and the features and the issues, it will show you all the linked artifacts. So you can see you, the linked tasks and test cases are visible right here on the boards as well. So we also provide resources to help you out. If you, know, if you want to get going with Spira and you like what you see today, we've got some standard information available on our website, which we'll provide us share uh, as read as uh, follow up links we'll send along. So first of all, we can supply a standard validation package. So when you sign up for using Spira, we will send a standard validation package uh, with the version that you're using. And that validation package basically states that the system prior to you configuring it has been tested and validated in accordance with its requirements. We'll send that to you. That way you would just need to validate your customization and configuration of the system as opposed to the core vanilla system. That's very validated for you. Uh, we also have some resources to help you do validation. We've got a HIPAA white paper, which you can see that goes through why we uh, are, are complying with HIPAA. We have a 20, the 21 part 11 compliance checklist and white paper that will go through how to set up Spira for you. We also have some pre-built templates in Spira, principally the regulated industry template that's already set up the way it should be. And we also now have a new white paper uh, written by one of my colleagues on how GAMP or the good manufacturing practice is moving from clinical system validation to clinical security assurance, um, system assurance, sorry. And so this white paper explains how is that transition going to happen and how Spira can help you make that transition yourself from a traditional CSV model where it's a one-off validation, lots of paperwork all done up front, to a CSA model where it's an ongoing, more iterative process, uh, more in line with Agile. And uh, this white paper is really helpful in, in describing how you, make, you can make that move using our platform. And then lastly, if you do need help beyond uh, the online resources or the Inflectora team, we do have consulting partners that are well versed in the life science industry. Uh, these are solution partners that we have validated and uh, have worked with us on many different engagements, uh, USDM Life Sciences and 2030 Consulting, two of our key uh, partners in the US who are very well versed in the life science industry, validation, everything to do with, with medical devices, life sciences. Uh, and so they provide additional resources if you need more on more hands-on help than just the Infectra's tools and, and, and resources. So with that, uh, the next step is the, is the Infectra demo. Uh, let me see in the questions before I jump into the demo. Um, there's a few questions, Adam, if, you, if you'd like to answer them now. Yeah, can wait till after demo. let me do it now before we get into the demo. That way, okay. uh, people uh, don't, don't forget them. So we've got one uh, here to, to eliminate the end user customer documents. The tool can act as a repository too. Correct. Yes, that's a great question. So the document management functionality of Spira, which I'll show you, does let you generate documentation, and that documentation can be generated from Spira and stored in the documentation. But we also have the ability to write content in Spira using the either Markdown or the Rich Text Editor, and that documentation, which could be SOPs, checklists, they can all be written directly in Spira using the document mod module, uh, and then they become part of your validation plan, and you can lock those too. Okay. Uh, the next question is based on the healthcare industry compliance guidelines, the product that's best for the industry is Spira plan. I would actually say, I know we advertised uh, this as Spira team in the, in the original uh, webinar email that went out, but actually I think realistically uh, I would recommend Spira plan because of the risk management module, particularly because you can do risk-based testing and risk-based development. Um, if you're not, working in the risk-based model, then I think Spira team would be fine. Uh, the big benefit of Spira plan over team is the risk management capability and the fact it's fully integrated. So I would say my, my top choice would be Spira plan. But if you are a smaller company and you're not really using risks yet, uh, you could always start with Spira team. And, and the great thing, Rick, is if they do start with Spira team, they can always switch to Spira plans very, very easily later on. So I would say pick the tool that you can you know, afford to use if you're a small company, start with Spira team if that makes sense. And and then when you get to start implementing a risk management methodology, you can always turn on those features by just seamlessly you know, upgrading to Spiral Plan. Yeah, sometimes that's a little bit confusing. Some people forget that this is just one tool. Uh, it's basically as you go up, you just unlock those features, which is really nice. Exactly, exactly. So um, one more question here. Uh, can we have the end tool projects with traditional methodologies like Agile or Hybrid and have good reporting of the status of the port uh, of the portfolio for the entire company, independent of the methodologies used. 
Yes, that's a good question. Uh, and that is correct. So in Spyro, we have different, pro we call them products, you might call them projects. Each product in Spyro can have its own methodology. Um, and you can customize the workflows as such. So you might have a project that's very agile, uh, that perhaps it's, it's a non GXP project. There's, it really is not regu regulated whatsoever. It's all boards and stories. We may have a project that's fully regulated. It's a hardware project. It's following a V model or it's a, um, you know, a waterfall methodology with phases and releases and Gantt charts. We can do that in Spy Inspira as well for that project. And then you may have one of the hybrid projects where, as I mentioned in the presentation earlier, you're being agile, but you have to be compliant. Often what that looks like is something where you have upfront requirements work. You then have a series of agile sprints to come up with a solution. And then you take a you know, a release candidate, and then it goes through the validation paperwork and some of the net compliance stuff that you wouldn't do otherwise. And then that gets released. So it has elements of, of agile in the middle, as it were, and it has compliant phases and tasks at the beginning and the end. All of those three kinds of project can all exist simultaneously in the system. And when you go to the portfolio view or the program view uh, as a manager, you can report on the progress and, and the risks across all of those different types, even if the methodology is different. Okay, that's all the questions we have for now. I guess we can hop into the application demo and I'll make sure that I can see your screen. All right, let's do that now. So hold on one second. Let's leave leave PowerPoint and hopefully you can yep. this is Spyro right here. I can Excellent. see it live. Excellent. So uh, just to, to go back over some of the things we talked about earlier on in the in the presentation, first of all, I'll, for those who are not familiar with the tool, I will orient you a little bit. So in Spira, and I'm going to use the term Spira to refer to Spira team or plan. Uh, this is, is Spira plan. It's the full functionality. Uh, if you were using Spira team, you would lose the ability to have portfolios and you would, went to artifact menu. The risk menu here will be grayed out with a little padlock. So you, so you know that. <clears throat> you, know, you, you know that you don't have it. So if we look at the, uh, the, uh, the main thing, first of all, in Spira, every single uh, system you're working with is concerned with a product. And you can see, for example, here we have some different products. We've got like a lab request product. We go, we're going to go down to life sciences further down. You'll see we have uh, life sciences as our portfolio. We've created a program called clinical trials. And we've got in this program of clinical trials, we actually have a medical device trial and a pharmaceutical trial. And we do have clients who are using Spyro to run these trials and track the requirements and the testing as an external observer. They didn't they didn't build the device. They weren't the drug manufacturer. They're the independent tester doing the trial. Then we have clients who are the manufacturers. They will be perhaps over here in the medical systems. They And there we have a pharmacy system or a patient uh, records system. So these are IT systems. Uh, similarly, we, we have manufacturing clients where they might be building, be building manufacturing systems. So each of the different types of system uh, would be a portfolio, uh, sorry, a program under a portfolio. And then typically each system that you're, that you're going to be testing is a product. So what I would recommend from a best practice is don't typically, at least, again, we, we can always consult with clients, don't create a new product inspire for every single version of something. So if you're going to create a new medical device or a new, or a new IT system, you would create one of them and it will be here under a program, and that will be the product. Then as you create new versions, you will create what we're going to call releases and sprints and phases and so on under that. But that means you have a master set of requirements that are the authoritative set for that system. Um, that's the reason for doing it that way, as opposed to if you create a new product every single time, the requirements are going to be uh, if, you know, separate for each particular one. You lose that master view. Now, there are some there are some use cases where people want to make archive versions. And so one thing you can do in Spyro is you can always clone a product at any point. So if you do want to maintain legacy versions of, of an archive system, you can always work in one product like this one, clinical medical devices, go to the administration and then clone that. Uh, so that, again, there are some different ways of working. Let's now let's look at uh, one of the projects. Let's look at the I'll look at a, a uh, let's say a patient records management system that we have. This is one of our samples. Now, this particular product is using a template. So if you go into the administration and you want to see what, what uh, template it's using, you can go to view edit products and you can see all the templates right here. And if I was to choose, uh, I'm in the patient records management. So let me choose that one. I'll just type patient and filter on it. You can see that particular 
product we're working on, it's in the medical systems program, it's using the regulated industries template. And that's a really important feature. In Spyro, we do support different templates. And a template consists of all the customizations and all of the workflows that go with that. So if, for example, you have GXP projects, ones that are regulated, and ones that might not be non-GXP, they can be in the same system. And you might have decided to have a GXP template or not a non-GXP GXP template. And we have quite a few clients doing that. And that's really important. Now, if you go back to the, the project we are working in, if you want to see what's going on, you can always use the admin menu on the top right. And you can see right from here, here's the regular industry template. And these are all the customizations. So if you want to see what is the requirement workflow we're following for this particular template, you can control click on that, go to the workflow. We already have one workflow currently active. And if you go to steps, you'll see here is the, the workflow. And it's a very um, regimented workflow. There's lots of steps, lots of actions. Um, so it's quite a complex multi-step process. If you were to look at one of our other templates, like the uh, regular, the uh, flexible template, that's one that's used in non-GXP environments. It, I think it only has three or four steps uh, that are active. So you can have a very complex prescriptive workflow designed for a, a regulated industry, or you could have one that is much more open and agile designed for a non-regulated project. And you can have them both the system. Let's look at one of the, the steps. <clears throat> so this is the, this is the workflow for requirements, which we're gonna, <coughs> which we're going to be creating in a minute. Before we do that, let's look at the workflow though. So we write the requirement. It's requested. It's then ready for review. It goes to under review. Once it's under review, it's going to be accepted or rejected. If we go to the accepted workflow status, this is moving the requirement. It's approving it. <coughs> you'll notice that we have this a require electronic signature and it's marked as yes. That's really important because what that's doing is saying when I go from under review to accepted, I need to sign that change. And that's really important for 21 part 11 uh, GXP projects. If we go back uh, to the requirements section over here, you'll notice that we do have types. So we can have different requirement types and they can be customized based on the type of project. If it's a software project, you might see epics, features, and, and qualities, and you know, user stories. If, on the other hand, it's a hardware project, you might see system requirements, uh, functional requirements, and so on, safety requirements. Um, that's really up to you. You can customize this, but you can have different workflows for the different types. <laughs> Similarly, when we talk about test cases, same thing. We can have test case workflows. If I go over here, so we have test case workflows for this particular regulated industry template. Same thing. We have a, we have a test case that will be draft. When we write the test case as per a uh, 21 part 11 process, we're going to have to approve it before test before we do the testing. So this particular test case is going to go from ready for review to approved. And we look at that particular transition. Notice that we've also enabled the electronic signature. So if you are starting out with Spira, uh, I would recommend when you create a project in this particular, if you're in the life science industry, use our regular industry template. It's been pre-configured to follow the best practices of the system, and it's ready to go. It means you don't have to go spending a lot of time configuring it. If you are curious how it was configured, though, if you go to our website and you do go to solutions and go to industries, we do have a lot of good resources on life sciences, and there's actually a blog which talks about how we configured it. And it's right here, configuring Spyro team for testing and validated environments. If you click on that blog and, and look at it, it describes how you set the workflow, how you set things up, what fields there are. This has all been done for you in the regulated industry template. Uh, when this blog was written a few years ago, we hadn't yet shipped the template with it. So you would do it yourself. We still have this, this blog so you can see what we did, but we actually have done it for you. you. You haven't got to do this manually. Go into the system. When you create a new product, use the regular industry template as your template as your starting point. Okay, so we've, we've got our project, it's using the right template. If we now go into the system, we can go to the dashboard. So one of the key things in Spire is this dashboard view, and that's going to show us any risks. Uh, this particular project doesn't have any, but it will show us all the requirements, what's the completion percentage. And here you can see we've got this fictitious uh, electronic health record system, and you can see we're tracking the different releases of the system, the patches, the patch version, the main versions, and you can see how complete are our requirements. Are they done? Are they behind schedule or on schedule? And we're going to track those requirements through to completion we track every requirement and we don't consider it complete until all the code is written, the code has been reviewed, all the quality gates have been finished, the testing has been done, and that requirement has been signed off on. So it truly is an end-to-end -end steps to doneness for that particular requirement. So if we look at some of the requirements in this particular project, we'll go to the artifact menu. Here's all the requirements. 
we'll go in the system and you can see here are some requirements here so what we're going to do for this example today we'll take one of these we're going to take one of these requirements and we're going to move it from its requested state build a test case around it mark it as completed run it and uh, and then go through that testing cycle now one thing that we have to, that we have in Spira that's really important as i mentioned earlier is the audit trail and the and one of the important things you'll find for life sciences is as well as the standard audit trail it's really useful to be able to track association changes and also have specific key points in time where you can see all the changes so to, to fully benefit from that there's a feature that i'm going to make sure is turned on called baselining so if i go into my project i'll go over here and i go to my settings you'll see that baselining is disabled so i want to go in here to view details i'm going to go in here and i'm going to turn on baselining set that to yes and now what I'm going to do is I want to demonstrate that uh, I want to track all the changes from this point onwards so that when I finish my test again, we generate my documentation, I've got a full audit trail. So I'm going to go into releases and let's pretend just for today we're working in release one. It's not yet finished. So we'll go into release one and we'll create a new baseline. So we'll create a snapshot. I'll just call it snapshot one. Uh, we'll say uh, system as it was, as it was at the start of the demo. Actually, not technically not, technically not the system, but the product. It's not the whole Spira. It's just this one product. So the system says your system, not Spira. Okay, so we've created the initial snapshot. Great. So now let's go back to requirements. And let's take this, this, this feature. So we've got this new feature, which is... Um, the ability to manage a um, appointment. So let's say we're going to assign that to be reviewed. So I'll mark that as review requirement and I'll assign that to me. Now, this particular version is set up so I can review it myself. You can configure the system to prevent the same person reviewing it and so on. Um, I've got different users here uh, just to avoid having to log in and log out again. I'll make myself a reviewer and I'll say, please review this requirement. All right. Okay, <clears throat> I'm now going to approve the requirement. Again, it's just pig Latin. It's not real. To pretend it's a real requirement, we'll accept that requirement, uh, and I'm now going to hit save. And now, because this is a, a status change that requires a signature, it has a pop-up box, and it's going to require me to sign it. Notice that when I went from requested to under review, that transition did not require a signature, so this didn't happen, and that's why you're seeing that. Now I need my my password which I don't remember because I'm using secure passwords because that's a good thing. It's in my password manager right here. So let's paste that in. We recommend password managers. Um, and now we've signed that change and the change has been accepted, which is great. Uh, next thing we want to do now is create a test case for it. So we'll go into the test coverage. We'll choose add. And if you look here, appointments management, uh, I don't see a test case related to this particular feature. So we have this nice shortcut, which is create a test case from the requirement. So I'll choose that. That's going to create a brand new test case that's going to be linked to this requirement. So I'm going to control click it over here. This is a draft test case. It would also go through its workflow and its uh, lifecycle. It's taken the name of the description. It's also got a single step. Now, let's say we want to be a bit more prescriptive in our testing. We might want to describe exactly what's being tested, appointments management. So, uh, you know, the user can click on a menu to display the list or, or display the list of uh, appointments. Uh, the list is correctly displayed. And you can put a screenshot in here if you want. I won't do that right now. We'll save that. We'll add, another, we'll add another step. Uh, we haven't got a lot of time, so I'm not going to spend too much time creating steps. But of course, you could create more than one. Um, click the user can click on a single appointment and view the details. Oops, there is a spell checker. Luckily, the details are displayed. All right, so that's where we would have our test case. We've now got a test case. This test case can also go through a, rev a review cycle. Let's do that now. So I'll assign it to me for review. And let's also do the approval. So approve it. Notice the padlock. When I hit save, it is going to force me to re-authenticate. I think it should be the passwords in my clipboard. Hopefully it's, yep. Oh, I have to put a comment in. So it's going to warn me a comment is required. So uh, approving in the workflow, you can specify if it requires a 
comment or not. There we go. We've saved it. It's been signed. Great. And now my test case is approved. Notice that there is a suspect flag. If I was to go back to my original requirement and make a change, uh, if, if I was allowed to in the workflow, depending on the workflow, I might not be allowed to, uh, we will flag it as suspect because we've changed the requirement. If the requirement was to go back in the workflow to non approved and changes were made, then it would definitely flag it as suspect. So we wouldn't miss that change. Notice that when I, if I wanted to run this test case, I can't, it's grayed out. Uh, that's because in the workflow in Spiral, we've specified that test cases can only be executed once they move to a certain status. And that's one of the differences between the regulated industry template and, say, the Agile template. In the Agile template, you can run a test case in any status. That's not true in the regulation template. Let's go ahead and move it to the start for testing. Once I do that, notice that the execute button is now available, as we expect. In real life, I might take this test case and put it into a test suite or a test set with other tests. Uh, for today's demo, just in the, in the interest of simplicity, I'm not going to do that. Let's just go ahead and run it as is. So I'm now going to run my test case, which links to that requirement. Run it in release one. Let's go ahead and let's go ahead and I'll pass the first test case. And I'll fail the second one with an error. Failed with uh, an error message. And I'll just take a random screenshot over here, pretend that's an error message screen, and paste that in. I want to log a defect associated with it, so I have traceability. Uh, let's say there is a um, system error in appointment setting. And for those who are eagle-eyed, you will know I've done something wrong, but I won't. I'll tell you afterwards. Hold on one second. I hit fail. So I failed my test and logged my defect, and I'm done with my testing. So you may have noticed, for those who are eagle-eyed, that I passed the first step and I didn't put any evidence. Now, in a software project, that's probably okay. In a regulated life science project, that is less than okay. And so in case you're worrying, like, well, why did he do that? Don't worry, that was by design. So I can show you that we actually have the option to customize that behavior in the testing settings. Is that It is then at the project level, not the template level. So you do, you do need to set up for every project. You go to testing settings, and you a few things you want to do. One is you want to disable the pass all button. And the second thing is you want to require that user has to enter an actual result, even for a pass. You also might want to enable that if you fail something, you have to log a defect. So these are some important settings you should change. And that's really important from a life science standpoint. It needs to match your process. So whatever you define as your process, you need to follow that. So that's how you would go ahead and you would write a test. So we've taken a requirement. We've approved it. We've written a test case, approved it. We've run the test. In real life, we would now do the post-approval of the test result and test case. I won't do this right now. But what I can do is I want to create a snapshot and see, has the system changed? What, is it, what, what are the, all the changes we've had in the system? So if I go back to my um, releases view and I go to my release one, let me go ahead here and create a snapshot two. Snapshot at the end of testing. Obviously, I haven't done that much. I've just run one test case, but... Again, it gives you an idea what you can do. Create that. And now if I go to snapshot two, you will see there's my change history. You'll see we've created a defect. We've modified a, we created and changed a test. We created a test run. We have created a document of a screenshot. We have also modified a test step, test case, and it's two steps, added two steps. In fact, we've also added an association between a requirement and a test case. And all of these things are now tra tracked in the audit history. So you can see here, we changed the status from under review to accepted, requested to under review, and we've got the audit trail of the test case association add. So we get this level of granularity in our change history, and that's really important. If I go back to my requirements view, so that's the, that's the baseline piece, uh, you'll notice that we do have this new test, this new requirement, and we can track right here the test coverage. So you can see that that one requirement is linked to a test case and it's failed. In real life, I would need to deal with that and fix that, obviously, uh, and, and remediate that. Let's say I was to do that and it passes. 
even if I was to pass the, the test case because I fixed the issue, fixing the defect, when you go to the test case and you go to the test run, there's always going to be the execution history of the test case. So we always do maintain the, the version control history of the result. And if I go to that test result, I can see right here the history is permanently archived in the system. There's the two steps and there's the error message with the, the screen that I put in. Again, it wasn't really an error message just from our website, but pretend it's an error message screen. There's the link defect right here. And the defect can now be fixed in the system. And when the defect is fixed, you can then reopen the test for running, it gets run, gets closed, everything is good. And we have traceability from this one defect. This is the defect in the associations to the test result and to the requirement. And if I go to the requirement, you can see the traceability in the other direction from this requirement all the way to the defect that was logged. A few more things I want to show. And for these things, I'm going to switch to a different project that's got more data. So I don't have to create everything. If you go into the library information, that's our most populated project in this sample. A few things to show here. I had mentioned earlier on there is code level traceability. We have that. So if I was to look at a particular requirement, I might want to look at the code you know, that was, in, that was as part of the change. If you go to the associations tab, as well as seeing requirements and test results and defects that I showed you already, you can also look at code commits. <coughs> and Spire will let you see down to the code level. So we, we implemented this one requirement. We fixed this one bug, which are right here. You click on them. And if you go to the files, we committed three files to do that. If I click on this one file, I will see the exact line by line change of what was concluded in that fix. So we can go down to the code level. We can also track code reviews and code quality as part of the quality of your system. So that's really important. The other thing that's really important for those on the Spira plan version is the fact we can do risk management. We can do basic risk management where we can track each of the risks track the probability, track the impact, calculate the exposure, and for any risk that we have, we can then link that to your requirements and to your test cases using the association feature. This is my risk, it's right here. Let me clear my filters. I guess there aren't any for this one. Let's see. Uh, I'm just looking here. We may not have linked, there yeah, we go. So this is one risk linked to these three requirements right here. And if you are working in a uh, other industries like automotive, you can have turn on things like FMEA, so you can actually track uh, other risk other risk features as well. For example, if we we were doing here risk based development, where we took this is not life sciences, but it's a similar concept. We took a risk, and from the risk, we then derived the actual requirements. So we go in the opposite direction. And in this example, we did turn on the third factor. We have probability, impact, and detectability giving us a risk risk priority number. So if you're working in like life science manufacturing, pharmaceuticals, medical devices, you will want the risk management most likely to include detectability. We do have that available using us the FMEA Spira app. Uh, two things quickly to mention in the last few minutes before we wrap up. Um, one thing that was mentioned earlier on was documentation. Yes, we do have documentation management. You can generate reports in the system and generate documentation from the system. Uh, so if I run a traceability report, you can actually generate a report from, from that in the system. The other thing you can do is you can actually create content directly in the system. So you could create, for example, a workflow diagram in Spira if, if that would be useful for your process flows for your documentation. We can also do uh, Markdown, where you can actually write the content using Markdown. And you can also use our rich, te rich text editor as well. So if you want to write checklists and other process documentation, uh, you can write those using um, any of the uh, Markdown or rich text features. Or if you want to track tabular data, we do have a spreadsheet option as well, where you can actually edit uh, tabular data in the built-in spreadsheet like that. And the last thing would be, if you run a report in Spira using the report center, you can generate, for example, a traceability matrix. That documentation can get generated into the system and then archived and sent for review. For example, this traceability matrix right now is under review. You can then move it through the same workflow where it can be approved with an e-signature. And when you do that, you can maintain different versions of it and then lock the final version inside of Spira. And of course, if you want to see the traceability matrix, click on the button and it will open in Acrobat. And looks something like this, where you can see the traceability between requirements and test cases in a nice, easy to use table. So any documentation you have to generate for your compliance or your auditors, you can generate from the system uh, and archive as necessary. 
Uh, and so that's some of the key functionality that we have in the live application. And thank you everyone for taking time out of your day to learn about how you can use Spira Team or Spira Plan uh, to streamline testing in the medical device and healthcare sector. Uh, we have other webinars coming up. Uh, there's one tomorrow, in fact, on IT security and healthcare uh, that looks, for, looks to be very interesting as well. I'll be attending that one. So have a great rest of the day and uh, thanks again for attending. All right, everybody. Have a good one. Bye-bye.